Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Um, all right, so welcome to the Theory Colloquium. I'm delighted to have Dan Spielman from Yale. Dan has been uh, uh, sort of a very uh, uh, inspiring researcher to me. He's worked in probabilistically checkable proofs, coding theory, uh, numerical analysis, smoothed analysis was the word that he coined to address his problems there. And today he'll be talking about sparsification of graphs. Thank you. And then I won't be using this mic. Okay, so this is going to be talk mainly about three papers. Uh, one with Shonghua Tang down here at the University of Southern California, where we introduced the problem of doing spectral sparsification of graphs. And I'll begin the talk by just explaining what that problem is, uh, why it should even be possible, and why we care. And then I will, OK, our first paper on the topic was involved. I will then present some much simpler papers on the topic. Um, I'll talk about a little work with Nikhil Srivastav on generating these spectral sparsifiers very quickly by a randomized algorithm, and then spend most of the time talking about work that Nikhil and I did with Joshua Batson, who's now in graduate school here at MIT, on getting explicit constructions of spectral sparsifiers. But let's get into what they are. Well, first, what's sparsification in general? The main idea of sparsification is you want to take a graph and approximate it by a sparse graph. Probably the original graph is dense, otherwise you don't need to do anything, and preserve some useful properties about the graph. Now, the first example that I know of where people do this is what people call graph spanners, where these preserve distances in the graph. Chu introduced these first, but people spend a lot of time studying how do I take a graph with distances on edges and approximate it by another graph with many fewer edges with distances so that the distances are similar. We're going to look at an entirely different notion that is more inspired by the cut sparsifiers introduced by Bankser and Carger. So what they were interested in was, if you have a set of vertices in the graph, you could be interested in how many edges are leaving that set of vertices, that is a cut, or if you have a weighted graph, the sum of the weights of those edges. They were interested in taking a graph and replacing it by a sparse graph where for every set S, those quantities are approximately the same within, say, one plus or minus epsilon factor of each other. That's sort of what inspires us. So it won't be obvious at first, but you'll see why. So our notion of approximation of a graph that we call a spectral notion is because what we want to do is we actually want to approximate the Laplacian quadratic form associated with a graph. And let me explain what that is. Um, it's really, Laplacian quadratic forms are really isomorphic to graphs. So instead of a graph, I think about this function here. What it is is x is a function on the vertices. So x assigns to every vertex a real number. So what the quadratic forms does is you sum up over every edge. You take a look at the difference of the function x across that edge, square it, and if there's a weight on your edge, multiply by the weight. And you take the sum of those. Now, these quad you know, it's a quadratic form, so of course you can represent it as x transpose some matrix times x. And that matrix is called the Laplacian matrix. When people teach about this stuff, they usually show you the Laplacian matrix first and then prove things about it and someday get to the quadratic form. We're going to go the other way. It's much easier. Um, I'll show you the matrix later, but the quadratic form is easier. OK, so let me just throw you an example just to get it, your mind straight. Oh, I don't have colors. Do you well, have colors on your screen? Yeah. Oh, we sort of have colors. They're just not very good. Well, that's OK. These nodes were a very beautiful color. So. <laughs> Imagine that <laughs> here's my function. <laughs> yes, thank you. So here's my function x of the vertices on the graph. So I, if I just assign this function, so minus 3 to this node, minus 1 to that node, and so on, that's like what a vector x is. I think of a vector x as a function from vertices to reals. What does the quadratic form do? You go across every edge. You take a look at the difference of the values. You square it which I've put down here in blue, hopefully. And then you just take the sum of those differences. So in this case, it evaluates to 15. <coughs> just an arbitrary example, but to fix in your mind what this quadratic form does. So I really think of graphs as giving me a function from vectors on vertices into the real numbers. And that's what we want to approximate. Here's another important example, which is when I put 0 on a bunch of vertices and 1 on a bunch of the others. 
Because you notice that for every node edge where both the endpoints are 0, I'll get a 0. Both the endpoints are 1, I'll get a 0. And for the edges going between 0 and 1, we get a 1. OK, so in this case, you pick up cuts. Here we got 1 for this graph. And this is, of course, a general phenomenon. Whenever I take the characteristic vector of a set, so I put 1 on all the, oh, well, here I put the opposite of the, here I took the characteristic vector of the complement. Sorry. Um, but you know, you put 1 on all the vertices in a set 0 outside, the quadratic form will give you the sum of the weights of the edges on the boundary. So the weights of the edges going from inside the set to outside the set. So this captures all of the cuts, but it captures much more. I don't have a half. So why don't you get twice the cut? Um, because I only did 0 and 1, not... Oh, because I count each edge once, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, trying to figure out where. OK, so now here, just to give it to you, here are the matrices. Usually, people talk about the Laplacian matrix as being a diagonal matrix minus the adjacency matrix, where the diagonal has the degree of every vertex on it. And the adjacency matrix, well, is 0 on where there are no edges and the weight of an edge where there's an edge. And people look at that formula. And you can then prove that the matrix is positive semi-definite. That just means that you know, this quadratic form is always non-negative. Again, easier to do from the quadratic form. Uh, you can prove that if the graph is connected, the null space is just the constant vector. Whenever you have a constant vector, same on all the vertices, this will be 0. And it's very easy to show that's the only way this is 0 if the graph is connected. An important thing to remember, that we completely understand the null space of these matrices combinatorially. Uh, one other fact I want to point out is that the Laplacian of a graph you can express as a sum of Laplacians of edges. So imagine, you know, I mean, this formula is one term for each edge. You can make a little Laplacian for that edge, and it's a sum of those. And even simpler, those matrices you get for the edges are very simple. Um, imagine, here's just the Laplacian for the edge 1, 2. It's got a 1 up here, 1 down there, minus 1's on the off diagonals. Yes? Sure. Yes. I think this is, that's your, hmm. Laplace Laplace was the compact things. Oh, the thing is, thank you, Henry. Good point. Spaces, infinite graphs can have non-trivial kernels for the Laplacian. Right, so to summarize, right, in the continuous case, you should make it compact. And then you won't have that. Yeah. OK. So I just want to point out the Laplacian for an edge is actually the outer product of a fundamental vector for that edge with itself. So in this case, the vector is 1 minus 1, because I've got a 1 at node u and a minus 1 at node 2, and you take the outer product of that with itself. It's going to be useful to me just to keep track that the Laplacian of, an, Laplacian of an edge can be represented as an outer product of a vector that naturally is associated with that edge with itself. In particular, that gives me one more expansion of the Laplacian that I'm going to use. I will let B u v, if u v is an edge, be that fundamental vector for the edge u v. So I write it as delta u minus delta v, where delta is, of course, you know, one at delta u is one at u and zero everywhere else. So I can write the Laplacian as a sum of weights of some vector times a transpose, where that vector corresponds to the edge. We'll use that later. But okay, that's all of our review that I want to do. Let me tell you now what we mean by approximating this quadratic form. So to talk about approximating, I first, well, I want to talk about inequalities, which putting inequalities on graphs is a nice thing to do anyway. So for two graphs, graph G and graph H, where here I give the vertices, the edges, and the weights on the edges by C and G, and I'll use D in graph H, I will write G is less than or equal to H. If, well, if the Laplacian of G is less than or equal to the Laplacian of H, which for us means that the Laplacian of H minus the Laplacian of G is positive semi-definite. This is sort of a standard notation in optimization. Another way of understanding that is for all vectors x, the quadratic form in x, I mean in G, is less than or equal to the quadratic form in H. So that is what I mean for one graph to be less than or equal to another. You know, you, there are a lot of less than or equal to operations you can get very simply. As a sanity check, you might note that if, if G is a subgraph of H, 
then if you remember that quadratic form, it should be obvious that the Laplace, that G is really less than or equal to an H in this notion. But there are a lot of other examples. Okay, uh, to do inequalities, it's helpful to sometimes have a little slack in them. So let's consider what do I mean for G to be less than or equal to some number K times H? Well, actually, what do I mean by K times a graph? I just mean multiply all the edge weights by K. The Laplacian matrix is the same thing that you get as if you multiply the Laplacian matrix by K. Okay, so that we're going to look at inequalities often like this. And in this case, of course, the quadratic form in G is always at most K times the quadratic form in H. Okay, now I've got inequalities. I can explain approximation. And please, if I lose anyone, ask questions. I've had a few espressos. I'm, they're free here. <laughs> so <laughs> I might go fast. Okay. Um, we will say that H is an epsilon approximation of a graph G. If H is less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon times G, and in turn is greater than or equal to 1 minus epsilon times G. In the bottom, I just put that in qu the quadratic forms. So when, for every single vector x, the quadratic form in H is multiplicatively approximated in G and H. They're approximately the same. It's a fairly strong notion of approximation. I mean, does this expression make more sense than that? It, it depends on who you are. <laughs> um, yeah. It, I mean, yeah, I, I put up both expressions because some people find one useful, some find another useful. Yeah. OK, let's do an example on what graphs. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Very unimportant high eigenvalue, which I normally would never bother. That's right. Yeah, you have to approximate very well so to get much this. Stronger than it's near in some trace yes, it's much stronger than any additive approximation of the Laplacians or anything like that. You can't look at, say, the difference of the, you can't look at, like, the norm of the Laplacian of G minus the Laplacian of H and get anything. Okay, so let's look at what are good approximations of the complete graph. So the first thing to know is that if you have the complete graph on n vertices, we know what all of its Laplacian eigenvalues are. I mean, aside from 0, because the all ones vector, for all vectors orthogonal to the ones vector, you always get the quadratic form, oh darn, I wrote n, that should have been n times the norm of x squared. All the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are n, all the non-trivial ones. So x transpose Laplacian x should always be n times x transpose x. Sorry to be missing the x transpose x. But I'll miss it for all the rest of the slides, too. So does <laughs> it make x a unit vector? OK. A good approximation of the complete graph comes from a deregular expander graph. So actually, how many of you are familiar with expander graphs? Thank God. Almost everyone, if well, not everyone. Correct. Yes. You should not assume that everyone. No, I usually don't. Good. I usually, and I will not assume you know too much. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell you all you need to know about them right now. Well, end a little later. But if, G, if H is a deregular expander graph on n vertices, that's actually equivalent to saying that all of the non-zero eigenvalues of the Laplacian are close to D. So all the eigenvalues are concentrated. Well, that, of course, means that for all vectors, unit vectors orthogonal to the all ones vector, the quadratic form is approximately equal to D. Um, the eigenvalues upper bound and lower bound the quadratic form. So at least the largest eigenvalue and the smallest. So you can work that through. So expander graphs, which we love so much in theoretical computer science, are exactly those graphs for the, from the Laplacian. We pretty much know what the quadratic form, uh, the quadratic form will be. So just to connect yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the one above uh -huh. is saying that it's also close to its degree, which is n. That's right. Oh, yeah. So the complete graph is a great expander graph if you're like its de high degree, n minus 1. So yes. What if I uh, think uh, of an expander as uh, something where the eigenvalue gap is large? That seems to be a different number. Well, so that's where we usually, so you, okay. It, I should say for all good expanders, the eigenvalues are near D. That's what it means for large eigenvalue gap, but people often talk about the adjacency matrix, in which case they're talking about the gap. So it's the or same real, as the gap yeah. from the zero eigenvalue. That's a good way of putting it. Yes, it's the gap from the zero eigenvalue. So the eigenvalues are far from zero. That means they're close to D. Actually, and the Ramanujan expanders are the best. If they were D half, I would still think they're far. Oh, okay. You might think of it as far from zero. I don't think 
in the old days, that was a good expander. Today, that doesn't cut it. <laughs> Inflation. <laughs> yes, Inflation. exactly. Well, I would think of an expander. Grass and expander has a random walk mixes fast. Yeah, OK. In that case, it would mix fast. That's fair enough. So actually, d over 2 would be good enough for this argument to work with some crude value of epsilon around a half, as we'll see in a moment. So what I want to point out now. This means that an expander is a very good approximation of the complete graph. You just have to multiply it by n over d. So if you take the expander, oh, you can't see that down there, multiply all edge weights by n over d. Now the quadratic form value will always be approximately n. OK, maybe if you were down to d over 2, it would be n over 2. But that's not so bad. It'll be a two-factor approximation of the complete graph. So for me, expanders are the good, best approximations of the complete graph that we can get. So that at least tells us that there are sparse approximations of some graphs out there. Let me do one other example. This is what we call the dumbbell graph. Let me take a complete graph, one edge, and, and another complete graph. The right approximation for this is you keep the one edge in the middle at the same weight, but you replace the expanders with, I mean, replace the complete graphs with deregular expanders, but blow them up by n over d. OK, this example is useful for one purpose. It convinces you. Well, I'll convince you that this is a good approximation in a moment. But also, it convinces you that you, need to have, you might need to change weights a lot when you take a sparsifier. Here, all the edge weights were 1 in what I did. Here, one edge weight's 1, but some others, most of them are n over d. That's going to be required if you're going to do this sort of thing. Yes? Uh, is it mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. that if the eigenvalues are all close to d, mm -hmm. It's a sparsifier in the sense, so you, you define in terms of some ordering. Like so I'll, I'll admit, oh, I haven't defined it exactly. But what I did define was, so you, can, you observe that if all the eigenvalues are close to d, yeah. then whenever I uh, take the quadratic form, its value will, you know, on a unit vector, its value will be close to d. And then uh, what we needed to worry is about the ratio of the values of these two quadratic forms. But one of them was always n. Right. And if the other one's always d, well, OK, then you get n over d. That's why I said multiply the edge weights by d over n. Yeah. Yes, the eigenvectors form. Yeah, and then you can figure out what the values of the quadratic form once you know the eigenvectors. Okay, let me just prove to you that this works anyway. It's a useful thing. I play with this sort of stuff a lot. You know, adding inequalities on graphs. Uh, there must be other uses for it. So here's one way of proving this. Uh, to write my original graph as a sum of three graphs. G1 is the complete graph. The edge is G2, and G3 is the other complete graph. Write my sparsifier as f1 and f2 and f3. And then you can just add these inequalities together. Because um, this plus works for the Laplacian matrices. And we already can prove things like if this is a good expander, then f1, this graph is at most 1 plus epsilon times g1. f2, heck, it's equal to g2, so it's less than or equal to 1 plus epsilon times g2. f3, same thing as with g. And then you just add these three inequalities together. And you get that f is at most 1 plus epsilon times g. So you can prove inequalities on different parts of graphs and sum them together. And it's not even 1 plus 3 epsilon. It's no, it's not even 1 plus 3 epsilon, which is very nice, actually. And was very important in Shang was in my initial paper on this, because this is how we initially set out building sparsifiers. OK, so here's our general goal. For every graph g, try to find a sparse graph h that is a good approximation of it. And I say, we're going to change the weights on edges, but we want it to be sparse. And actually, what we're going to wind up doing is we are going to wind up doing this almost as well as the Ramanujan graphs approximate the complete graphs. For those who don't know Ramanujan graphs, spectrally speaking, they're the best possible expanders. We'll only have a factor of two more edges. And it turns out, I'll try to motivate the question of getting rid of that two at the end of the talk. OK, so why am I doing this is worth saying now. OK, so Sean and I started out doing this. Because we were interested in trying to solve systems of linear equations in Laplacian matrices. These come up in a lot of applications. Um, the ones that I'm very interested in now are doing learning on graphs and all sorts of regression on graphs where people have graphs. And these are often the equations they want to solve. Uh, they come up when people are solving elliptic systems of partial differential equations. If you try to, say, solve maximum flow or min cost flow by an interior point method, you take a look at all the systems of linear equations you're solving everywhere along the way. They're linear equations in Laplacian matrices. There are a lot of applications of these. OK, so it turns out that in numerical analysis, there is a very well-established theory 
of if I want to solve a system of linear equations in one matrix, can I do it by approximating, by solving another system of linear equations in some approximating matrix? And that notion of approximation is where we stole this notion of spectral sparsification from. Um, uh, the notion that I'm giving you of spectral sparsification is exactly what the numerical analysis requires. So, so if, if H is a good approximation of G, then solving linear equations in G can be done by solving linear equations in H. It might not be obvious yet that that's simpler, but it was an important component in what we were doing. At least sparser helps, you got to think. Okay, other reasons for doing this. Well, you can see that if H is a good sparsifier for G, then it preserves the eigenvalues approximately. Eigenvectors, sort of, if they're isolated, it preserves most spectral properties. It preserves spectral properties. Think about um, if you treat your graph as a network of resistors and you want to know the effect of resistance between two nodes or the commute times of a random walk between two nodes. It's preserved in these things. Other reasons to do this? Well, they, they do generalize expanders, and that seems interesting. If we think of expanders as approximations of the complete graph, these are now sparse approximations for any graph. And, okay, they're stronger than cut sparsifiers, and one advantage is these you can actually verify. You can actually check the eigenvalues. Cut sparsifiers, we knew how to build, but we never knew how to check if we actually got one, because it was a randomized algorithm. Okay, so here's the main theorems I will give you, maybe even today. Let's see. Mm -hmm. um, for every graph G, yes, there is a good sparsifier of it. <laughs> so H will be an epsilon approximation of G. The number of edges in H is at most four times the number of vertices in G divided by epsilon squared. So that's, you know, good constants. And we know you can't make that better than a two. And I, I will add as a side comment that the edges in the sparsifier are a subset of the edges in the original graph. I have a fantasy of proving a very weak form, or a somewhat weak form of this theorem today with almost all the details. We'll see. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I also will tell you briefly, you can do this also we by... We all have to have some espresso. <laughs> <laughs> right, we'll see. Um, I'll tell you also, you can do this by random sampling as well. You don't get quite as few edges. You get like n log n edges, where n is the number of nodes. Um, this is the first way that Nikhil and I got at this. By random sampling, you don't expect to get better than that. Otherwise, it'll just be isolated vertices or something. But the random sampling I'll explain first, probably. Okay, I want to connect this for a brief moment to other matrix approximations. So first, the only reason it ever occurred to us this could be possible was because of the result of Bankser and Carter. They show you can get approximations and cut, appro cut sparsifiers with n log n over epsilon squared edges. And it's just like the same sort of thing as ours. The quadratic forms have to obey the same inequalities, but only for vectors that are characteristic vectors of cuts. So they only needed vectors x and 0, 1 to the n. We needed vectors in all of our n. But this is what, if it hadn't been for that, we never would have made this conjecture. If you just mm -hmm. wanted cuts, mm -hmm. why would Um, I'm not so sure why it, I don't think it, Semiretti gives us that sparse graphs. At least I don't know how to get that sparse graphs out of it. Some but I might be missing nice something. Oh, but oh, but it depends on how dense. So I want to get down to a linear number of edges, like order n, even if you start out with, you know, n to the 10 ninths edges. And if you have n to the 10 ninths edges, I don't. I mean, maybe if it, but if it does give you something, I'd like to know, but I don't know yet. But it's how. the error term like huh? epsilon n squared. Yeah, so you, that. If you have small cuts, you are going to be way off. Okay. Oh, the I graph see. may be dense, but there are mm -hmm. small cuts which are violated by a factor of omega n. Okay. I see. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so there are other matrix approximations out there. I mean, there are people doing random sampling of matrices and low rank approximations of matrices. So these differ from what we do in two ways. Uh, an important, a great one is they work for all matrices, but they get additive approximation errors, not multiplicative. So they're stronger in that they work for all matrices, but they get additive error. So um, getting multiplicative. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, I mean, so we only work for Laplacian matrices of graphs, which are very nice matrices. I mean, it's very important. They're positive, semi-definite, and we understand their null spaces and can say a lot about them. These other techniques work for all matrices, but they get additive error, which doesn't work for our applications. Okay, so here's the weak theorem I want to give you. 
I'm going to try to prove the details that I can get you an h, which is a 6 7 approximation of g. So less than 1 is all I needed for the number to make sense. We're the number of edges at most 6 times the number of vertices. And I think I can give you most of the proof. Epsilon is 6 over 7. So, yeah. OK. So actually, what th we're going to do is we're going to reduce this to a problem in linear algebra. And very soon, I will stop talking about graphs entirely and just talk about sets of vectors, which means we're going to throw away a lot of knowledge, but uh, means there's you know, something else you could use if you want to improve what we're doing. Uh, so we're going to reduce this to linear algebra. And actually, all I'm going to need to prove, you can trust me, that 6 7 thing, all I really need to do is construct a, a graph H whose Laplacian, well, I want the quadratic form values always to be between 1 and 13. Uh, that's where the 6 7 came from. <clears throat> but that's all I need to do. Now, this is for unit norm X. Actually, this is for all X now, because I got X on the top and bottom, and they cancel. So I want the ratio always between, uh, compare 1 plus 6 7 divided by 1 minus 6 7, and you'll get 13. Um, so how, the first thing you might ask yourself is, how the heck do you show something like this? We spent a lot of time wondering that. Turns out there's an easy way to do it. Um, you replace x, you multiply on the left and right by a matrix. So instead of x, write mz for a matrix m. Just put that in there as long as you're not changing, as long as every x can appear, no harm done. Y yeah, or at least on the range of x, right. And actually, everything we're always going to work orthogonal to the all ones vector, because that's in the null space. OK, so what do we choose for m? I will write it as the m Laplacian of g to the minus 1 half. OK, you might be worried, because the Laplacian is not invertible. Take the pseudo inverse, namely the inverse on the range. So for all intents and purposes, geometrically the inverse, and then take its square root. And that, of course, makes this denominator trivial. So what you wind up having to do is just only worry about vectors orthogonal to the all ones vector. I now need that the quadratic, this ratio of quadratic forms always be to lie between 1 and 13, because my denominator disappeared, and I've got LH and LG up here. So that really means that all I, I'll write this as lambda of this matrix here. I mean all non-zero eigenvalues. There's one zero eigenvalue for the all ones eigenvector. All non-zero eigenvalues, I need to lie between 1 and 13. OK. No. Unfortunately, products of Laplacians tend not to have meanings. Um, yeah. A products of adjacency matrices do. Laplacians tend not to. OK, this does not not as bad as it looks. So let's recall, and I first want to just convince you why this should at all be reasonable. Let's recall that how I wrote the Laplacian of G is the sum of elementary Laplacians. Why, why yes. Um, yeah, because you're not, because it's not acting as an op, the, when you're multiplying them, they're not acting as an operator on each other, I don't think. Right, it's not an intermediate yeah. operator when you're doing cells. So but you will see a fourth derivative later in the talk. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Huh? What is lambda? Oh, I just, by lambda, I just mean the set of eigenvalues of that matrix. The, the spectrum. Right, the Except spectrum. For the Except for the zero one, which we're always going to remember doesn't matter. Okay, so. Let's write the Laplacian of H as a sum of elementary Laplacians in the same way. So H is going to be a subgraph of G. So we write it as a sum over edges of the weight that we're going to give the edge in H, I call it SE, times the outer product of these vectors corresponding to edge E that gives us the Laplacian for edge E. So we write LH as that sum. E uh, oh, E is an edge. So I, yeah, we'll, we'll take all the, we'll sum over all the edges of G. If this gets messy, it'll become cleaner in a minute. Um, so OK, now really I can expand. Everything is linear here. So I've got a sum that looks like this. And I want to put its eigenvalues between 1 and 13. And the difference is, OK, if I'd set all of these SEs to be the weights in the original graph, this thing would be sort of trivial. I'd get the identity. Maybe I'll put that on the next slide, actually. But I don't want too many terms on zero. Yes, I did put it on the next slide, thankfully. OK, so here's what I want. I want a sum like this to have all eigenvalues between 1 and 13. I'm going to rewrite it. Take this LG to the minus 1 half times VE. Call that VE. OK, now I've got a simpler expression. 
I want to get a set, I want to get a bunch of numbers SE so that this sum of their outer products, so these are rank one matrices, all the eigenvalues should be between 1 and 13. And what, here's one useful fact, if I did it right. I'm missing one term, but let's ignore it. Um, the sum of all these outer products, if I didn't put these SEs here, is the identity. Because, okay, I don't have, can people see the bottom line? Probably not, and doing this ain't going to help. So, um, <laughs> Uh, the point was that the sum of all of these terms, if I added them up, got me LG itself. So if I sort of plug in LG here, I have LG to the minus one half times LG times LG to the minus one half. That's like the identity. Really, it's the projection orthogonal to the all ones vector. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, and I forgot to put the weights here. But you could incorporate them in. Yeah, I forgot to put the weights into the BEs. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, so let's look at this VE picture a little more. So what we've got things down to is M vectors, where M was the number of edges, living in Rn minus 1. Um, we know that their sum of their outer products gives us the identity. So this is what people call a decomposition of the identity. I have a bunch of vectors, the sum of their outer products is the identity. <coughs> it has a lot of useful properties. I draw this circle around it, because that means that the moment ellipse of those vectors is the unit sphere. That is, whenever I plug in a unit vector, OK, that's a PowerPoint error, not mine. I crashed and changed, lost some edits. Sorry. This was, I had written unit vector here. Whenever I take a unit vector, if I sum its inner product with all of these vectors and square it, I'll get 1. OK. What are we trying to do? We are trying to take a downsample this, take a subset of these vectors, maybe weight them. That's what our subgraph is going to correspond to. And we want, then, the moment ellipse of this thing to be relatively round. OK, we're going to get here that for all unit vectors, when you take a look at the sum of squares of inner products, it'll be between 1 and 13. But you could get it closer, of course. So we're going to say, you know, for any subset of vectors whose moment ellipse is the identity, you can downsample it, put in some weights. Oh, the moment he's, ellipse? He's just saying the, yeah. the, the size was exactly one. Right. And now <laughs> it's kind I don't of. Understand. Oh, no, I meant the, for all unit vectors u, if you take, well, one way of getting the moment ellipse is take a ve unit vector u, take the sum of its inner products with each of these vectors v, and squ well, square the inner products. And yeah, so we're going to say you always. Don't oh, it's a short sum because it's. Oh, oh the, these are different vectors ve, which can have different lengths. My v's can have different lengths. But um, so I mean, was like, these are all the vectors V. Well, if it's only in R2, I don't know if the, I really drew the moment ellipse faithfully here. Actually, what is but, the moment ellipse? Oh, the moment ellipse. Why is it a circle? Oh, why is it a circle? That's because we have a decomposition of the identity, or precisely because if I take the inner, a, a vector, a unit vector, and I take its inner, the, squ the sum of the squares of its inner products, that sort of corresponds to the moments um, in the direction U. So no matter hmm. U if you take the sum mm -hmm. of the scalar products. So if you take the uh -huh. sum of the projections onto that yes. square, it, so the sum of the projections L2 lengths is, is 1. Something right. Like That's because it's a decomposition of the identity. Yeah. Adam? So if the points were mm -hmm. the average of the points with the origin, then this would be the covariance matrix. Right. But so if you, do you, can you preserve the average of the points? Um, so Nikhil worked on that on another paper, on, which is relating to John's decompositions. And the answer is sort of, but better results need to be obtained. But yeah, you can roughly preserve the, cent the, the center of gravity as well. OK, so again, here's our goal. We're going to go to sparsify graphs. We'll do it by choosing subsets of vectors. And I'm just going to talk about vectors from now on in linear algebra problems. <clears throat> okay, so here's our main existence theorem. Well, in the special case, if you give me a sum of vectors whose outer product is the identity in n dimensions, then there are a bunch of scalars so that you can take the sum of those vectors with these scalars, but very few of those scalars are non-zero. At most, 6n are non-zero, and all eigenvalues will be between 1 and 13. I see. Uh -huh. So most of them are zero. Yeah. And the fact that on those... Mm -hmm. <coughs> the weights are much bigger, mm -hmm. still leaves the spectrum essentially where it was. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And right, we can tighten this up. If we go instead of 6, d times the dimension, we can get this ratio of d plus or minus 2 root d minus 1. 
And as d gets big, this goes to 1, of course. But we'll just do the special case. Well, first, let me tell you how to do it by random sampling, just briefly. That is, if you want to get order n log n over epsilon squared non-zero terms. What Nikhil and I first did is you basically sample these vectors. We're going to just sample a subset of them. Um, you sample them with probability proportional to the norm of the vector squared. And then you, you have to reweight them by the reciprocal of the probability that you sampled them. And then you apply a concentration theorem of Rudelson about sums of rank one matrices. And it just gets you the result flat out. Um, and uh, our initial paper didn't, it turned out that was the analysis. We started out because these norms of these V squares turn out to be the effective resistance between the endpoints of the edge. So it's a natural way of sampling things. And then we can comp Oh, he said if you have a bunch of elementary unit vectors. I mean, if you have a bunch of, of the visa, oh, there's a good question. If the visa bs are all elementary unit vectors, then this would like be like applying Chernoff bounds in each column, and then it, you'd see that you need n log n as well. So what is the role mm -hmm. of the concentration theorem? Can you give me some interest? Yeah. So roughly what it says is if you have a bunch of matrices when you have an upper bound on their norm and they're all rank one matrices, if you take a sum of them, take a sum, you sample them at random then the different then the sum of the sample is approximately equal to the expected sum of the sample in this case being approximately equal to the identity meaning in it's a difference in norm um, I see. so if your sample the expectation comes out correctly and the concentration theorem says that it's oh yeah so actually there, there are about five, three or four different flavors of this theorem rudelson's one i, th I think rudelson 99 just got it some expectation bound for the norm of the difference, and then with Rashinin, they later improved it. And you can get this also from the Alshwedi Winter uh, matrix turnoff bounds. So Rashinin has some lecture notes on getting that out of it, which is, I think, much simpler than the other proofs. But, but anyway, so it, it's pretty easy to get this by random sampling. That also gives us hope that you could get it down a little. Okay, so here's the existence theorem I'll prove for you today, or I'll prove some of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this iteratively. We're going to add one vector at a time to our sample and try to do this in such a way so that we preserve all of the eigenvalues. So if we're going to do that, we first need to understand what happens when you add a vector. So let's understand what happens when I add a vector. Imagine this is the spectrum of my matrix A. So you're starting with the empty graph? We start with the empty graph, yeah, or an empty set of vectors. But let's uh, see what happens in the middle. So we've got some matrix A. These are its eigenvalues. This is the real line. Let's see what happens when we add an outer product. So the first important thing you may remember is the eigenvalues interlace. If these empty circles are the eigenvalues where they were, the new eigenvalues will just move over a little bit and never cross when you make a rank 1 adjustment. OK, so if you want to make, OK, that's qualitative. If you want to make this quantitative, what you do is you capture all the eigenvalues by looking at the characteristic polynomial. Yes, they're always increasing when you're adding a positive, right, when you're adding a positive semi-definite matrix, they're always increasing. This, there's one thing I said that's going to be counterintuitive that I'll fix in a moment. But, well, maybe it will be, we'll see. So the way to do this precisely and understand it quantitatively is look at the characteristic polynomial. Because ca the roots of it are exactly the eigenvalues. We can understand what happens to the characteristic polynomial when we add a rank one matrix or an outer product of a vector with itself. There's a theorem called the matrix determinant lemma, um, which tells you that exactly the update is, well, it's given by this formula here. So it's multiplying some term times the original characteristic polynomial. So rather than having you digest the formula, let me give you a physical interpretation of it. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to say that f t for the most part, the new roots, of course, I mean, the new eigenvalues would be the roots of this equation, but they're also pretty much the roots of this, unless you have multiply, unless you have multiplicities. So, okay, let me give you a physical interpretation. The formula is messy. So here's my image. Imagine you have a ramp, and your eigenvalues live on the ramp, from lowest to smallest. I have a bunch of, what we're going to do is we're going to start out with our old spectrum. So this is the old spectrum, lambda 1, lambda 2 through lambda n. Put a little barrier sitting on the ramp, just that the eigenvalue is resting again to keep it in the right space. Now, what happens when I add a vector? 
Well, OK, I call these eigenvalues charges. When we add a vector, what's going to happen is it's going to put a charge on some of these barriers. It's going to repel the eigenvalues. OK, so what happens? Each of these eigenvalues has an eigenvector. I'll call the eigenvectors the UIs. When I add an eigenvector v, I take a look at the inner product with v with ui. I square it. That tells me how much charge to apply to this barrier. So in other words, if, if I add a vector that's only a in direction of u1, I only put a charge on this barrier, and I don't put charges on any of these others. How and do you know that they don't cross from what you're telling us? I'll show you. OK. okay. So you'll see. OK, so the barriers will, all barriers repel all eigenvalues. OK, yes. And all, right, really, all the barriers repel all the eigenvalues. OK, so there's only an issue if you have zero charge on some barrier, what happens? But it's going to be an inverse repulsion law. So you can't actually get past one. Yeah. OK, and there's a force of gravity that's sort of biasing you down by one. So this comes from this formula exactly. Um, if you take a look at this formula, our new eigenvalues are the values of x for which this is 0. And this 1 is sort of gravity biasing you down. And these are an inverse repulsion law. So there's a magnitude of the charge you're putting on the barrier. And then you, you know, repel more the closer you get. You look at the fixed points. That's how we understand this formula. So that means huh? x has to be smaller than all the uh, x has to be, well, no, there are going to be many solutions. One. Because when x pa every time x passes a lambda i, you'll get a different solution. The lambda i's that are smaller point one way, and the lambda i's that are bigger give you sign terms of the opposite sign. No, it's not. A p well, you have to multiply it by the original characteristic polynomial to get a polynomial out. But the roots. But this is yeah. You and but this is still tells you where the roots are. Okay. So this is yeah. So sort of what we're going to be trying to do in our process is we're going to try to add vectors one at a time. And we want to push the small eigenvalues up without pushing the big eigenvalues up too much. So we spent a lot of time staring at these pictures. Because we are always going to want to add one vector at a time. We're going to put want to keep the eigenvalues I'm together. Sorry, I, I just Please. Why do you not want to push the big ones? Oh, well, we, our goal, OK, all the eigenvalues sort of started. Well, we do want to push the big ones up, but our more, we want to keep them together as a pack. Right. So we're going to worry more about keeping the small ones close to the big ones, I should say. Um, OK, so this is our, the physical model we used to think about this. So here's some examples. And the first one to think about is what happens when all the weight, oh, darn, all my colors are gone, again, is on u1. So what if I actually add the vector u1? That means I completely just put charge on this barrier and none of the others. Well, you, d you do know what happens if I do that. If I add, say, just the vector u1, I increase this eigenvalue by 1. So how does that relate to this picture? Well, you know what happens if I, if, I don't, if I just ignore all these other eigenvalues. This one is just going to increase. OK, now I told you the eigenvalues don't cross. So this might disturb you a little bit. But if you look at what's really going on under the hood, they haven't crossed. The eigenvalue that was here went up to here and got stuck at this barrier and can't get past it. The eigenvalue that was here went up to here and got stuck at this barrier. And this eigenvalue went up to here. And none of these other eigenvalues want to move. And you can see that pretty easily, because if this eigenvalue went up to here, then that means that the electrical force is not enough to push it past gravity this way. So these will just keep resting on their barriers. So when you're adding just one eigenvector, you think of it as pushing one eigenvalue this far. But really, you should think of it as this little chain reaction of these things pushing each other up. Anyway, this is how we think about it. Um, let me skip my example of two eigen of putting all the weight on two eigenvalues. Let me show you the important example, which is when we put equal weight on every single eigenvector. That's a really nice example. So imagine I put a charge of one on each of these. That pushes the eigenvalues up just a little bit, and it, but it pushes each of them, and they all interlace. Okay. Now I'll show you why I'm so. Uh -huh. If lambda two. What will happen, so if lambda 2 and lambda 3 are very near to each other, still lambda 2 will get stuck. I mean, the new lambda 2 will get stuck between those two barriers. But it sort of adds extra momentum to the next one, or extra force, I should say. OK, so let's see what happens when we add a balanced vector. Let's see what happens to the characteristic polynomial. So if this was my original, if this is the new characteristic polynomial, if I put in that formula that I had, 
I get that what I'm doing is I'm actually, if all these inner products are 1, I'm multiplying it by this term. So this is 1 plus the sum of 1 over lambda i minus x for all of them. This you can actually see, this is the minus the derivative of the characteristic polynomial. So our new polynomial is the original one minus its derivative. If we add a balanced vector. Well, we don't necessarily, we, how to put it, I say we'd like to pick such a v. We don't, one probably doesn't exist. But a random one is balanced. So here's the next point. A random vector is like this, an expectation. Okay, so remember, we have a very special set of vectors. They're a decomposition of the identity. That means for every ve eigenvector ui, and in particular for every vector, but you know, for all the uis, the expected square of the inner products is 1. Okay, that means a random vector is balanced in expectation. So if we had a random vector from our set, we know that the expected inner product with every single eigenvector is 1 over m. Okay, this is going to give you not our proof, but the intuition behind our proof. This is where we started. Um, we said, what happens if we're really lucky? In our ideal proof, at every single step we add a random vector, well, okay, let's imagine that every single step we add a balanced vector. Okay, one might not exist, but let's just see what would happen. We'd start out, all the eigenvalues are at zero, and our characteristic polynomial is x to the n. Okay, if I add a balanced vector, here I'm just trying to show that it's the same in every direction, one eigenvalue pushes out, and our new polynomial is x to the n minus, well, 1 over m, because they're m vectors, times the derivative. You do it again, you now apply, you think of this as an operator, you've now applied the square of it. And if you keep doing this, we know what we will get as our ex expected characteristic polynomial. It's always, after i plus 1 steps, 1 minus, well, 1 over m, the derivative to the i plus 1 power applied to x to the n. So we know exactly the polynomial we'll get. Hopefully the eigenvalues keep going down. And you will ask yourself, when you're done, you know, is the ratio between the largest and smallest at most 13? Thankfully, uh, it's better than that. Uh, in the limit, you can prove the ratio goes to 1. It's because we know what these polynomials are. These are called the associated Laguerre polynomials, which is a classical family of orthogonal polynomials that people have studied from time immemorial, or at least for the last 100 years. Um, probably much longer. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Um, okay, so we know exactly what these polynomials are, and we know what the ratio of the roots is. And actually, I think I forgot to put it down here, but the ratio is, ex this is exactly where we're going to get this d plus or minus 2 root d minus 1 from. It's exactly the ratio of the appropriate, the largest to smallest eigenvalue of the appropriate associated Laguerre polynomial. So why are the associated Laguerre polynomials, so that's like so... Um, actually, if you look... Throughout random matrix theory, you, when you take a look at expected characteristic polynomials, you get things from classical orthogonal families, be it or meet polynomials or Laguerre or associated Laguerre. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So even in your ideal, so it's ideal proof of right. the graph itself. The no, the idea, it's a really the, yeah that whole d root t you know plus or minus two root d minus one comes from the linear algebra. Mm -hmm. Maybe it can be improved by using graph theory. Uh -huh. Complete graphs, yes. what you're yeah. typically trying to approximate in the expander case. Uh -huh. Do you already have the ideal vectors? Uh, um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know. I don't think so. So, yeah, trying to do it with a complete graph is an interesting question. And hopefully, I'll give some good questions about that in a moment. Okay. But of course, that was our ideal proof. How are we actually going to do a proof? So, here's our idea. We try to corral these eigenvalues by putting a bar an upper barrier and a lower barrier at minus n and n. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to always add a vector so that when we do it, you know, the eigenvalues shift over, and then we shift over the barriers a little bit. Now, for our proof where I'm trying to get these numbers 6 and 13, the lower barrier I'll advance by a third, and the upper barrier I'll advance by 2. Just shift the barriers in general? Uh, it will Is it a function of that inner product? Or what oh, no, mean? actually, the, we just get absolute numbers by which we expect to fix them. So there is a natural amount to shift the barriers given that you're adding a new vector. So every time we're going to add a vector and shift the barriers. So this is sort of how our proof goes. 
I mean, you want to shift them by one, but that's too ambitious. We shift one by a little bit less than one, a little bit more than one. How, I'm sorry. N and plus n. Oh, so they started out at minus n and plus n. After the first step, they'll be like minus n plus a third and n plus two, and they keep going. So here's sort of the way our proof wants to go. We keep adding new vectors. At each step, we get a new matrix. We add a vector, and then the barriers shift over. And we try to keep all the eigenvalues between these two barriers. And let's see. When we get to step 6n, with the numbers I gave you, the lower barrier will be at n, and the upper barrier will be at 13n. And we'll have a ratio of 13 between them. So what I need to do is I need to convince you that there is always a vector I can add such that I can shift these barriers and keep the eigenvalues between them. OK, there's, there's a slight problem with that. So I need to show this vector always exists. But how am I going to do that? And as an inductive hypothesis, the assumption that the eigenvalues lie between my barriers is just not strong enough. I would love that to be my inductive hypothesis, but it doesn't work. Because actually, if the eigenvalues all clump up right next to the two barriers, I'm sort of in trouble. So we need a stronger inductive hypothesis. Um, I mean, it's a shame. You know, we want to actually, if, if the eigenvalues just live near the two barriers, then the bottom eigenvalue won't move at all with the rank one update, and the top ones will shoot off really fast. Are you assuming uh -huh. that there's uh, no, um, no multiple um, eigenvalues? Or are no, I can't assume that. We can get multiple eigenvalues along the way. Right, so I say that's why this is not a strong enough inductive hypothesis. We need something stronger. Um, OK, so what we are going to do is introduce a potential function. Now, I should just tell you that this is sort of, um, been my dream for 20 years to write a proof like this because I've always believed that you know the right proofs come by some magical choice of potential function. I've seen many people do this. You know, we need some way of characterizing what are the right choices of eigenvalues. And I would we did not guess this potential function. We brute force tried many, many, many potential <laughs> functions. Okay? So don't think that yes, this was the obvious thing to do, right? I, I said, we're going to try to prove it this way, and let's enumerate potential functions and try them all. OK, so here's what we're going to do. Um, we want to make, you know, we want to have a penalty for having any eigenvalues near the upper barrier, and we want to be happier the further they are away. So what we looked is the sum of the terms 1 over u, the upper barrier, minus the eigenvalue. So in other words, this function, if an eigenvalue actually hits the upper barrier, it blows up. And the further away you are, the happier it is. And I'm going to point out, this is a, very fortunately as an expression in terms of traces. This is also the trace of u times the identity minus a inverse. That'll be useful to us later. But people who know random matrix theory will be used to seeing this in terms of the Stilchis transform. I have no idea if there's any formal connection. But that is where we saw it, um, one of the reasons we thought of trying it. Hmm? Oh, yeah. A is, yeah, it's always a Laplacian. No, I'm, I'm forgetting about graphs for now, but yes, it is. Okay. So one of the key points is we're going to always actually make these potential functions less than or equal to 1. So not only does that mean all eigenvalues will be less than the barrier, but they have to be less than it by at least 1. Well, our potential functions will always be less than 1. They always have to be you know, pretty far from it. And it means more than that. It means... Like, you know, you can't have any two eigenvalues within distance 2 of u. You can't have any 3 within distance 3, and so on. This enables us to really bound something about the distribution of the eigenvalues when I bound this potential function. If this thing is small, you know, I, kn I know a lot about how close, how many eigenvalues can be to u. So when you enumerate mm -hmm. them, did you try all the powers of <laughs> the <laughs> try we, try, we tried the powers, yes. Right, they don't help, but they don't give us any better bounds. Exponentials were in there. Okay, we also do a lower barrier. So did you get huh? the minus one by trying all positive powers and summing the <laughs> <laughs> No, we did not do that. <laughs> okay. so, so we'll do the same thing for the low end. Okay, we get a potential function there. And now here's sort of the way our proof is going to go. At the beginning, with our barriers at minus n and n, our potential functions both have value 1. Because the barriers are n away from the zero eigenvalue. And as we go, we just need to show that at every single step, there's always a vector we can add so that both of the potentials remain less than 1 when we add it. And we advance the barriers. Now, I want to point out one thing. And this is a gap. 
it took us a long time to figure it out. We don't just add a vector. We think we can get away with just adding a vector if they're all the same norm. We add some multiple of a vector. And I, I only have a few minutes, but I'll give you a brief idea why. So not only are we going to pick a vector, but we're going to choose a multiple of the vector. This term I call s. It tells us how much of the vector to add. OK, and we do this, and we show that we can keep the potentials bounded by, away by 1. This is sufficient for induction. OK, I should give you a brief idea as to why. And then I'll jump to open questions. I mean, OK, so what I need to show. Oh, Dan, yes. Oh, I'm fine? Oh, OK. Oh, good. Then I can do the whole proof. Oh, wow. OK, te in 10 minutes, we can do the whole proof. Great. OK. When do we go for dinner? We OK, so what I need to do is show you I can advance the lower barrier by a third, the upper barrier by two, and add some multiple of some vector in my set of vectors and keep both of my potential functions less than or equal to 1. OK. So let's first look at the upper barrier update. So here's my potential function. With my new upper barrier, I'll call it u prime. So u prime is u plus 2. We've moved it up by 2. And recall this was the trace of a matrix, which is u prime times the identity minus the original matrix minus our new vector, and we take the inverse. So thankfully, again, you know, People spend a lot of time understanding what happens to matrices when you change them by a rank 1 matrix. Not just the matrix determinant lemma, but what is the exact form of the inverse. It's called the sh by the Sherman, Morris, and Woodbury formula. We know exactly what it is, and we can figure out exactly what this trace is. So here's what it is. Um, it's the potential function at A, evaluated at u prime, plus this term, which I'll decode for you in a moment. But we know, just take it for now that we know exactly what it is. And it's a ratio of quadratic forms. Okay, what we need is we need to preserve that the new potential function is less than or equal to the old value of the potential function. What we've done is we've moved u prime, it's u plus 2, and we've added a vector. So when we rearrange it, it gets us a formula like this. We need that 1 is greater than or equal to s times v transpose times, there's some matrix in here. The key point is it's just a matrix times v. So we, need an, we have an upper bound on a quadratic form, which I will rewrite for you. I'm just going to call this matrix in here u sub a. So we need that 1 is greater than or equal to s times v transpose u sub a v. So that makes sense. If you think about it, our goal is we are moving the upper barrier up a little bit, and we're adding a vector. And as we add more and more of the vector, increasing the multiple of the vector that we add, it pushes the eigenvalues further and further up. So the upper barrier is going to impose a limit on how much we can impose up or down the, I mean, increase the eigenvalues. That's how that determines your s. Yes, sure that's right. And that's why this is an upper bound we care about. The lower bound is going to go the other way. The lower bound, we want to push the eigenvalues away from a barrier. And we want to push them away from the lower barrier. So we're going to have a different sort of formula. It's going to be 1 is less than or equal to s times v transpose lower barrier matrix. I'll call it for now. We'll analyze this thing in a moment this matrix, but it's a lower bound on that. So what we need to show at every step is that there's a vector v and a multiple of it s so that 1 lies between this one quadratic form for the lower barrier and the upper barrier. That's what we need to show at every step. OK, so here's what we know. And I'll tell you why in a moment. We happen to know a bound on the expectation under a random vector v from our set of the quadratic form in the upper barrier matrix and the lower barrier matrix. In the upper barrier matrix, it's at most 1, and in the lower barrier matrix, it's at least 1. So I'll, I'll show you this in a moment. It's not that hard, it turns out. Um, now, I will tell you, we were completely stuck with that for a moment because well, yeah, because you know, if you have just an expectation in one thing, you're really happy. You can apply Markov. You can say something exists. You have expectations in two things. You usually can't do anything in probability. Um, but we get lucky. In this case, it tells us that the expectation of the quadratic form in the upper barrier matrix is at least less than or equal to the expectation of the quadratic form in the lower barrier matrix. So there is a vector v, at least, for which the upper quadratic form is less than or equal to the lower quadratic form. One. Right, there's one, yeah. Sometimes it's only one. And even better, given that v, we can now find an s to multiply them by that sandwiches one between them. 
OK, now I'm going to tell you, this is a very, I mean, we didn't think about that S for a long time. We're very frustrated looking at this. And my dream is that someone will get rid of this S. I'll just tell you now to keep you excited, and maybe to wake Henry up, because he always, <laughs> Henry always fell asleep in my complexity classes, but still followed. So, so I know he knows what's going on. Um, <laughs> so um, if you can get rid of this S here, when all the vectors are the same norm, you prove the Caddison singer theorem, which is a very big conjecture in functional analysis. And so, and well, S, OK, how to put it? If all these vectors have the same norm, it seems like we shouldn't need this at, to reweight anything. Like if you were handling the complete graph, why should you get an expander graph with weights on it? Uh, 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 I mean, I, we do. Ramanujan doesn't, you know. <laughs> um, I don't know. OK. So. <laughs> all right. Yes, sure. Mm -hmm. If I just look at this, if mm -hmm. I would forget about the expectation, yes. I would think that S equals 1 is the only solution, right? Yeah, yes. you... And then I would be a little <laughs> worried because I say, well, you have yeah. a little error to your expectation, and if it doesn't work in your favor in both directions, then no S will work. Yeah, it, it, right, yeah it can concern you for a long time. As I say, just remember, the only thing we need to know from this is that one expectation is bigger than the other. So if you want an easy way to do this, is now take the expectation of this term minus that term. Okay, I mean, no, I spent a while doing it. The expectation of this one minus that is bigger than or equal to zero. So it's really one expectation, because it's linear. So you really get an expectation of something is bigger than or equal to zero. And, but yes, yeah, sometimes, I mean, we've looked at this to try to get rid of the one. Sometimes both of these, you know, sometimes this is a half and this is two thirds. I mean. Sometimes there are cases where we never win with s equal to 1. And this iterative proof probably won't work if you want to prove Caddison Singer. That's OK. Um, yes? So LA is a positive definite? No, actually, neither. Oh, one of them might be. I forget at this point. But definitely one of them isn't. Because it can be like 0 and something negative. Yes. yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We do avoid negative. Yeah, we do show that the vector we get doesn't have this negative. That is a good point. Yeah, that would be bad for us. But we don't get that. But one of these matrices, I think, was positive, semi-definite. One wasn't. OK, so maybe we'll see. Oh, yeah, we'll see it in a moment. So let's ba show you how we bound the expectations, since I, I was told I had a few minutes to finish the proof. So if you want to get at the x, something like the quadratic form, v transpose uav, it's, just, it's convenient to write this in terms of the Hadamard inner product of matrices. So you write this as ua, this dot is the inner product of vv transpose, where that's the rank 1 matrix, where that Hadamard inner product is take the matrices, treat them as vectors, and take their inner products, you know, just inner product pointwise. OK, then this proof gets much easier, because then you can take a look at what is the expectation of ua dot vve transpose. Um, everything, at inner products are linear, so the ua comes out. On the other hand, I told you what the expectation of VEVE transpose was. It's a decomposition of the identity. So this is the identity. Or maybe it's 1 over m times the identity, because it's the expectation. Yes. So this is the trace of UA. So all to get these expectations, we just have a trace. That's, wait, wait. Um, you, you might know that anyway. Right, I mean, physicists usually know anyway that when I take a quadratic form with a random unit vector from the sphere, it gives me the trace. Right. And really all you needed from that was that it's okay. a decomposition of the identity. Yeah. OK, so now let's take a look at back what our two terms were that we have to get the trace of. This was that matrix I showed you before, but it was a little messy. Let's take a look at the right-hand term first. The right-hand term, yes. u prime i minus a inverse, that was just our potential function. Actually, even better, evaluated at u prime as opposed to evaluated at u, so we know it's at most 1. Uh, sorry, because u prime is bigger than u, and that makes the potential function value smaller. Yeah. So when you move u prime, there's a little slack here. We need to tighten that to get all the do d's and stuff like that, but whatever. Um, OK, so here we get this is at most 1. This other term turns out to be at most u prime u minus u, and there's a reason for that. Um, if you want to take a look at, like, the potential function evaluated at u minus the potential function evaluated at u prime. 
the right way to do that, you know, the first order is take a look at what is the derivative of this thing as a function of u. Well, the derivative is just this term in the numerator. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, of course. And, yeah, and so you would approximate it by the derivative times the difference, and because this is a convex function, it goes the right way. So this is at most 1 over u prime minus u. <laughs> well, I think so. Okay. No, because if you had u upstairs, it would be different, right? Oh, yeah, if we had u upstairs, it would be different. Yes, right. Now, you've got to check um, whether the function, sorry, is growing. Yeah, not convex. Convex and, sorry, shrinking. One of those two directions. It works. Um, okay, so this gets us a 2 down bottom here, so that's a half. So this tells us that our expected upper barrier trace is 3 halves. And for the lower barrier function, we can do the same thing. And in this case, with the numbers I stuck in, we get 2. Mm -hmm. And even, yeah, some miracle that the same inequalities really work, because we flip things around for the lower barrier. So this tells us that the expectation of the upper barrier quadratic form, well, it was less than or equal to 3 halves, which is less than or equal to 2, which was the expectation of the lower barrier quadratic form. That's all we needed to tell us uh, that we could take a step. Okay, so here's what happens in the end. We now know that we can always choose some vector and some multiple of it to keep advance the, the, so that when we advance the barriers this much and add in this vector, the potentials always remain less than 1. And we keep doing that, and after 6n steps, the lower barriers at n, the upper barriers at 13, we've added 6n vectors, and the ratio of the eigenvalues is most 13. Okay, so that is all of the proof, actually. I mean, the... In the paper, we get the type constants. But this at least gets you a... Oh, I wrote 13 approximations. So there should have been 6 sevenths approximation with 6n vectors. Okay, so if you tighten up the proof and you get dn vectors, you get a ratio like this of the eigenvalues. This is, of course, the ratio of the largest to smallest appropriate root of an associated Laguerre polynomial. And that's actually what you get out of the proof. And this, interestingly, I want to point out, is less than twice as many edges as used by a Ramanujan expander of the same quality of approximation of the complete graph. So we're very close to this Ramanujan thing. We don't expect to beat it by this technique because I think that the Laguerre polynomials are sort of the right thing to get out. I think if you're going to get the Ramanujan bound or beat it, you probably need to use something special about graphs, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, sorry, not beating, achieving it, I should say, achieving it. If you want to get as... Um, so, okay, so here's some open questions. Uh, I guess I gave them already. First, if you're just doing this with a complete graph, you should get an expander. We get weights on the edges. Can you avoid getting those weights? We know no reason they should be there, but our proof, they're just inherent. And, you know, can you just get a plain old regular expander rather than one with weights? Say, so can you get to the Ramanujan bound? That might use something special about graphs, we do know ways in which these vector spaces you get from graphs are different than just arbitrary collections of vectors. But uh, we really don't know much about it, so can you use anything about graphs? Here's another question. Can you get a faster algorithm? I mean, th this proof I just gave you was constructive. You can do it in polynomial time. But can you get something fast? So like if you wanted to generate a random expander, you take a union of a bunch of, of a constant number of random Hamiltonian cycles. Can you do anything like that here and get a sparsifier? Would be handy. Because, you know, this is still too slow. Okay, let me bring back to the Cadison Singer conjecture, which is this outstanding conjecture. If you go back to the statements we were proving, in the case where all the vectors have the same norm, can you get all of your constants or weights being, well, I wrote 0 or 1, but really 0 or just something else, binary valued? We don't know of any good reason that you need these funny weights we're throwing in when all these vectors have the same norm. And let me point out that in the random sampling proof, that's what you get. If you, throw, if you do the Rudelson thing, where they get like order n log n vectors, okay, they get order n log n, we need order n to prove Caddis and Singer, but when they get order n log n, when all the vectors have the same norm, they get just zero, one constants. Uh, does it have an equivalent graph uh, statement, or is it like... Uh, let me think about that. I don't think it's, you know, it, 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 okay. It roughly says that when you build a sparsifier from a, your original graph, the weights of edges should always be like one over the effective resistance of what they were. So there's sort of a natural weight to blow them up by, and it says you can blow them up by their natural weight. Yes? In the dumbbell example huh? that you showed, it 
seems like you need to change the weights. Right? You need to change the weights, but you change them by the effective resistances of the edges, or one over the effective resistances of the edges. So you change them by the right amount. So given the graph, yeah. The 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 yeah, sort of given the graph, there is a set of canonical weights that they should be. And, and these uh -huh. are the effective resistances in the original graph? In the original graph, or one over the effective resistances in the original graph, yes. So you mentioned one of the motivations uh -huh. of solving linear Oh, the systems of linear equations in the Poisson so, matrices. So you would want to solve, let's say, yeah, Poisson uh -huh. equations, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like LX equal to U mm -hmm. equations. Uh, but it seems to me, essentially, you're, you need to spend the same effort as computing the green function. The pseudo inverse of the local ah, oh, so so we don't. So no. when I said we use it for solving linear equations, we do it by something like the conjugate gradient. So we use an iterative method. So we're using all of this to build preconditioners. So we never form the pseudo inverse. So actually, in the end, we got nearly linear time algorithms for I mean linear in the number of non in the number of non zeros in the matrix out of now, this technology. Can you do this for the pseudo inverse, meaning that oh, can get a sparse. Okay, you cannot get a sparse, no, we don't get a sparse approximation of the pseudo inverse. Okay. Rather, we get an efficient procedure that computes something close to the pseudo inverse, is the right way of putting it. Um, you might be able to write it as a sparse factorization of the pseudo inverse if you're willing to use powers in your factorization or some polynomials. So you, you, you could write like the pseudo inverse as a matrix polynomial and some sparse matrices or something like that. Right but we can't get to it exactly. Okay. It's Any other sorry. questions? Thank okay, you. thank you. We can still go for questions. Okay. Oh, I'll keep the mic on then. Is there any more? Yeah. So, so can you do this for uh -huh. collections of graphs simultaneously? I mean, if I find I collect, I have two graphs. Oh, I mean, I if you have... Enough, like, you know, simultaneously. Uh, I haven't thought about it at all. So it's an interesting question. If you have two graphs, maybe with the same, you want to get a subset of edges of both of them, or they have the same set of edges, perhaps, and different weights on them or something. I've, yeah, I have no idea. Haven't thought about it. Yes. Uh -huh. On the first bullet item yes. here, I mean, if you ask the question, does there exist? Oh, yeah, sorry. We know there are. Right. Know there are. Actually, well, wait. Let me take that back. We sort of know there are. Um... Oh, yeah, the Ramanujan ones, we only know sporadic constructions. Oh, I see. Okay. And it's still in graphs? random graphs. I mean, Joel random Friedman has worked really hard to prove that random graphs get us very close to the Ramanujan bound. Mm -hmm. So he's certainly closer than we are now, I believe, so by our construction. So at least uh, with yeah. the factors of two and so on. Yes. The but so the sort of question is, yeah, can you do anything like this for right. it? So, yeah. so to ask a question uh -huh. like this, I could ask a related mm -hmm. question, which is if I start with a, say, d squared regular expander, mm -hmm. does there exist a deregular subgraph? Yes. <laughs> oh, um, okay, so it's already known that you can split an expander into two subgraphs, both of which are expanders. That's I'm trying to remember who this result is due to. And this is Ramanujan? Uh, not quite, no. And it's a random construction. I remember Alan Fries, I think, is one of the authors, but I don't remember the others on the paper. But it's a random construction. And yeah, it was before. They're, they're just getting some sort of expansion out. I forget. Old. Yeah, it's an old paper. Yeah, we're going back at least 15 years or something. Right. That's the old style expanders. Yeah, they weren't getting close to Ramanujan then yet. Yeah. So uh, you're not in Bureau, not in linear paper, mm -hmm. but uh, like the inverse uh, expander mixing about the two. Right. Short if you have to only study zero one vectors and still get some effective bounds, right? Right. So can you, I mean, maybe this can... Oh, going from... Different. I remember I looked at that paper a lot when we were working on this, and I couldn't find a way to use it for what we were doing. I don't remember so why. The Right, Banks or Cargo, they work with zero one, but there are examples which are not sparsifiers in the Banks or Cargo sense. Sorry, which are sparsifiers in the Banks or Cargo sense, but not in ours. So they're very different notions. So zero one may not be good enough. Yeah, for zero one is, well, yeah, we definitely know that zero one is not good enough for this purpose. So also there you lose something, but it's not the terrible, right? Yeah, no, we, can, we can give you examples where you hu lose a huge amount, like where you're a one plus epsilon cut sparsifier, but not even a root n spectral sparsifier or something. So they can be very different. Um, I think I deleted that slide, though. But I can show you examples where they're very different, unfortunately. Right, that's because the lineal 
in Belu's work, I think was looking at maybe number of edges in an induced subgraph or something like that, which can, when, which can wind up being very different. I mean, approximating that doesn't necessarily approximate the number of edges on the boundary. Because uh, two approximations of one can be very different approximations of right, one minus that. Can you do yes. can the huh? randomized algorithm mm -hmm. be done locally in a distributed way? Oh, that's an interesting question. Can the randomized algorithm be done locally in a distributed way? I don't know a way to do it. So to tell you the truth, the way we do the randomized algorithm is we first have to compute the effective resistance <laughs> across every edge. Yes. And the way we do that is by, um, we can do it quickly by using Johnson, Linden, Strauss and solving log n systems of linear equations. Which, by the way, we now know a faster way of doing that doesn't involve all this sparsification stuff that... Um, Kudus, Miller, and Peng recently came up with an n log squared n time algorithm for that. Well, I should say it involves a little bit of it, but it's much simpler than this work. But yeah, but if we need to compute the effective resistances, and I don't know a local way of estimating that. Well, you could do so that with uh, essentially with a Poisson equation with the right input. Oh, essentially you solve yes. the circuit. You you write the right, you, right, you could, but I don't. And you put the input that you put a current there, and oh, you could. I just don't think of it as local. Because it could, if you graph something like a, an expander, you might miss. You can get the estimate very wrong. Although this so by local, yeah. I mean that oh. it only requires information from neighboring nodes. Oh, I see what you mean. But you run it in many rounds and right. try to. So you run oh. it iteratively, but you only. Mm, that okay. That's an interesting question. You might be able to. Again, I don't know. If I think about the linear equation solvers we have now, they're still multi-level algorithms. Right. So they, well, you would not think of as local. Um, but a really good question is, is there a good way of approximately computing all these effective resistances quickly without solving systems of linear equations? You might be able to do that by a local algorithm. And it would be nice. It's easy enough to do it locally if you don't yeah. care about mm -hmm. speed. Oh, like, OK. Well, that's a good point. Yes. Um, if, you want to, <laughs> if you don't care about the iterations being, like, uh -huh. the reason that you need to do all this complicated mm -hmm. global stuff is to keep the iterations of all right. the conjugate gradient thing to end up uh, oh. amortizing that to almost linear. And You're right. You conjugate gradient you can do as a, right, you can do the right. solving linear equations locally. That's a good point. Right, if you're willing to wait a while. Yeah, that's the problem. Yes. Okay, thank you. Very thank much. you.